Welcome to a bonus episode of Hey Chaplain. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. Today, I called my police chief friend from Minnesota, Tim Eggerbrotten, to come back on the show again and talk about the examples we set and the mentoring we do within a police department, especially from one generation to the next. Every cop is setting an example, either good or bad, for every other cop within their sphere of influence. So I wanted to run an idea past Tim to see if we couldn't be a little more deliberate about being a good example, building some relationships, and making young officers feel heard. Here's Tim Eggerbrot. Hello, Tim. How are you today? Jared, I am awesome. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I'm good. I've got a subject I want to talk to you about. I'm interested in the mentoring that happens in a law enforcement career. Uh, can you give me a good example of maybe something you experienced, somebody that came along and mentored you? Absolutely. Uh, I started working in corrections as a correctional officer and I knew I wanted to be a cop, and I would watch those guys. It was Moorhead, Minnesota, and I'd watch the guys on the night shift. Mm. And they were they didn't know they were mentoring me, but that's what our lives are like. I mean, when we were, you remember like in high school watching, or when you were in junior high and seeing the senior high kids walking right. down the hallway, it's like, man, that's pretty cool. And so when I was a young correctional officer, I'd watch these night shift Moorhead police officers and they were active. They were out there thumping and bumping and, and you know grabbing warrant lists and going out there. And but they were also polite to people. And they were like, and they were big dudes. And uh in my mind, that's what I thought a police officer should be. You know, that these these big tough guys that uh go out there, get the job done, they had fun doing it. And, you know, so that was my, my first real impression of, like, that's what I want to do. I want to go out there, start on my shift. I want to grab a fresh warrant list and go out there and, and start hunting warrants, you know, and, and yeah. go out there and do proactive traffic enforcement. I mean, that's what I wanted to do, like, forever. And mm-hmm. so just, like, put me in, coach. I'm going to do well. And, and so having these these seasoned officers that would just go out there and rock and roll it it like stuck with me so much when i started uh my law enforcement career we didn't have a a real fto program i mean i was brand new i i rode one shift with the sergeant and then the next day i was on my own with a cadet <laughs> i had a cadet that was that wanted to be a cop and this was like our our fourth of july weekend it was crazy busy and and so it was just like, throw me into the fire, which was fun. I mean, but it was <laughs> dangerous for me and dangerous for everybody else. But we yeah. made her through. Well, in larger departments like where I serve, you know, there's a very well-developed FTO program. Mm-hmm. Our recruits become new officers and then immediately enter into a multi-phase uh, program where they spend, you know, a month with an officer uh, riding with that officer and then another month riding with a different officer. And they, they go through these multiple phases. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it's well developed, but it's interesting. What the, the, the mentoring, the coaching, the, the training and setting an example that I see are often 26 year olds training 22 year olds. Yep. And so it's good. And, and these are officers who are qualified to be FTOs, but I don't see a lot of 40-year-olds mentoring the 22-year-olds. Right. And, and so other than the FTO program, I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot of it anywhere else. Yeah. I know that the police department values you know, operating independently, uh, solving problems for yourself. Hey, we gave you training. So use that training, apply it with some common sense. Uh, I mean, I know that that's a, a, a virtue that's valued in law enforcement, but I, I, just, I just would like to see more. And I'm not sure how we can make that happen or what we can do. There's, you know, other good examples of people being good mentors out there. Uh, mm-hmm. I just, I, I feel like I'm maybe not seeing it as much as I want to. 
Yeah, um, I think your sergeant, like when you when you go through FTO, and then you're out on the streets. I think the sergeant is one of those, like mm-hmm. where you're 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 asking questions. You know, you're kind of thinking, oh, that's that person knows what they're doing, and they've they've had some experience. So I think it's, although it's not a formal process. Hopefully the vetting process, when a person becomes a sergeant, hopefully they, they have those teaching capabilities and those, uh, but I think like most frontline officers after about two years, I think a lot of them would, would they can relate to their sergeant because that's the one, that's the supervisor they have the most contact with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know, like bigger agencies, if they have like corporals or, you know, different ranks and everything. But I sure. know like for most agencies that that patrol sergeant, if you're in patrol, that patrol sergeant is they're usually kind of hardened and they've they've been there, done that. And mm-hmm. uh, but a good sergeant can lead and mentor just, you know, with their examples and like pull them aside and say, hey, buddy, what's going on? You know, you lost your cool back there. What's what's up, man? Yeah. That's a, yeah. a critical phase that that liaison between the administration and between the frontline officer. Who were the strongest influences in you, you know, early career and mid career? Uh, we're a small department. And at when I got hired on, we only had 12 cops and mm-hmm. uh so the sergeant, um, we, we just had a sergeant, a captain, and then the chief. And my sergeant and I didn't see eye to eye at all. He, had, he, was, uh, he was excellent. He was a great cop. But uh, he was really complacent and just kind of always mm-hmm. smiling and, and just not really aggressive. And I wanted to be more aggressive. Yeah. And uh, so, so I didn't really glean much from him, but I would... Like other officers that from other agencies, even you know that we would meet at coffee and and we would say, hey, uh, you know, like where we thought alike, and we we wanted to go out there and get it and and just be aggressive, but because um, that's that was the fun part of the job was going out there and and holding people accountable for their actions and and then solving issues. And we were like again, we're a small agency, so we were everything. When uh-huh. when we'd get a burglary, we'd we'd go out look for the bad guy, and we'd go back and process the scene, and uh, you know, and try to find evidence and w- whatever the case was. If it was a sexual assault, we would go out look for the bad guy, uh, interview this the victim, and we'd do, you know, take her to the hospital and and do yeah. all that stuff. But I think you when you're newer. Or even at any phase, I think you're looking for that that mentorship, and you're looking for those the the big brother, the big sister, that somebody that that has more experience than you, but then thinks like you too. And so I think you you're naturally hungry for that. And usually there's somebody in the department. The problem is with that is that if you attach yourself to somebody that's not ethical and not moral. Uh, not healthy. Right. Yeah. And then, then all of a sudden uh, you're taking on their bad habits and their way of doing things and you're dragging your knuckles on the concrete like they are and you're beating <laughs> people up and, and, uh, and you're thinking that that's how the world is. It's that mentorship. There's formal and then there's informal. We're all informal mentors, good, bad, or otherwise. And, yeah. Uh, that's well, that's the, what I worry about are mm-hmm. the mentors who don't realize they're mentors yep. and they're setting a terrible example because you are setting an example. Oh, if, yeah. you're, if you've got people that are younger than you or newer than you, they are watching. And yep. so you, you are setting an example. When, when I teach at the academy, I talk about compartmentalizing their mentors and that you'll have an officer who is maybe really good at finding stolen cars mm-hmm. and you need to learn that from that officer. And figure out what he knows and and what he's you know honed and 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 gain that from him, but don't gain everything from him because that same officer may have a drinking problem or that mm-hmm. same officer might be on his third marriage or or some other shortcoming that you don't necessarily want to adopt and so and so you want to pick and choose you may have mm-hmm. an officer who's not particularly good at most 
important areas of police work, as you would judge it. But he's been married for 25 years. Mm -hmm. That's a skill. Right. To, 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 to stay married in law enforcement for that long, that, that's something that you should learn. And you could compartmentalize learn that from him without mm -hmm. learning any of his bad habits and vice versa with a different officer. And, and I try to encourage new officers to you know, compartmentalize like that. Did you ever have one that just set terrible, a terrible example? Oh, yeah. For you? These, these same guys from Moorhead that, that I idolized, you know, they were... Uh, they were active. They were, you know, so I, I, I took those things from them and, and they, they taught me right or wrong. They taught me ask, tell, make. Uh, yeah. But then they went overboard on a lot of things too, where it was hmm. almost like, a, I don't know, not a gang mentality, but like, you know, I mean, we're the brothers in blue and, and, you know, you mess with us, we're going to mess with you. And so it's like, right. Right. Uh, they would kind of cross those boundaries sometimes. And, uh, and as a correctional officer, they'd bring these people in and they'd be bloody and, and they'd just look at us and shrug their shoulders like, yeah, I don't know what happened. You know, and when you pick and choose what you see are the best attributes, it's like a football team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't have 11 quarterbacks on the football team. You have to have, you know, somebody that, that uh, different skill sets and, by the way, this is the year the Vikings are going all the way. I had to throw that in. <laughs> and, and, as soon as you guys so, just lose a quarterback, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if we have a quarterback, but I, I just know that that your uh, your podcast, they're diehard Vikings fans. So this is the uh -huh. year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me, when you were uh, higher up the ranks and when you were a chief, were you able to find time? to invest in younger cops and how did you do that i tried i mean it i loved my guys like family i really did and uh so um yeah i mean it's it's hard to like be on a social level but then but to you know make sure you're calling them by name and you know and, and again we're a small department so we'd have monthly meetings where we'd all get together and then we would just talk about whatever the issues are and and take notes and and hopefully resolve some of those issues and some of the issues were you know 20 years old and they're the same issues everywhere and so I did my best I think to try to try to develop and foster those relationships I know I failed miserably like looking back now there's some some aspects that I did really well you know, like leading by example and doing different things and uh, in the department or as a police officer. Uh, but there were other parts that, uh, like in my personal life, that, you know, I was one of those guys that drank way too much and partied hard. And and uh, so that, if somebody, if, if a young officer was looking at Chief Agerbrotten and saying, uh, I like how he went out and did this cop thing, whatever it is. And I like the fact that we got new vehicles and whatever. But then when they see me in my off time, if they're taking that too, like, okay, this is how he handles his pressure. He goes out and gets drunk and, uh, you know, and, and takes bad chances with alcohol. And, uh, you know, so that part, but none of us are, are perfect. And so I give myself grace for that too. Sure. Um, if you had to do it over again, what little things would you have added or implemented? Um, I would have gotten to know the officers more on a personal level, like their families, and and uh, I, you know, I would have I would have been more intentional on that. Uh, I was a I've been an entertainer, one man band for twenty five years, and so I was doing that when I was a sergeant. I was doing that when I was the police chief. And I'd have people come in, like friends of mine from other agencies, and they say, hey, Chief, you know, you're spending way too much time doing these gigs. And uh, uh, and so, and, but I would get kind of defensive and say, well, it's my off time, you know, and I wasn't embarrassing anybody. I, I'm good at it, you know, and, yeah. and so I would, I would, I would probably do a little less of that. When I was police chief, I was doing about 130 shows a year like four hour gigs and they're all in the area and but it was it, but on the good side of that it uh it broke down a lot of barriers where people would come up and talk to me that would mm -hmm. never talk to a cop 
and uh, but they would music was the level playing ground there you know i mean we we all liked the same music or whatever we had that in common and so people would come up and talk to me but but i i probably spent too much time like dividing like i should have been more more focused on on my police chief and my department uh my officers and and i was but i i could have been more i could have been more intentional and i'd uh, like to hear your feedback on this idea so I'm thinking of people that are supervisors two or three levels up. So not the sergeant in patrol, but the sergeant's supervisor, whether mm-hmm. that's a lieutenant or a captain or whatever they have at that department. I'm thinking people two levels up or even three levels up that they would go do a two or three hour ride along with a young cop. Mm-hmm. And so and I know this would work in patrol where, you know, the the captain or the major that's over that patrol division just schedule, okay, three hours, I'm going to go down the roster and I'm going to go ride with this officer today. And then next week, I'm going to ride with the next one. And then next week, I'm going to ride with the next one. And it's just three hours. I know that they don't have a lot of time. I know, especially when you get up into that mid-management and, and higher up in administrative you know, responsibilities that there's just a lot of meetings. There's entire days where it's nothing but meetings. You don't have time to do a three hour ride along, Mm -hmm. but maybe you could carve out just once a week time to go ride with somebody that's 10, 15, 20 years, your junior, and you're not critiquing them. You're not evaluating them. You're just spending time with them. You're just, you're just literally along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And, and that would develop at least a little bit of relationship because I do ride alongs. And, and my goodness, even just a four-hour ride-along, I typically do an eight-hour shift, but, but even just a four-hour ride-along, I, I can pretty quickly develop a bond and a connection to that officer. And if I could see some of these supervisors, like I said, two or three levels up, spending time with these 22, 25, 30-year-old officers that are relatively new in the career, I feel like that would help retention. I feel like that would would make them feel, especially these new Gen Z officers, I feel like it would help them feel like the department cared about them and that the department mm-hmm. knew who they were. And and I, I feel like there'd be a lot of benefits. What's what's your impression of that? Well, I think that's a great idea. Uh, like you said, I mean, it's tough. And I but I think if you if you made that your intention and you you said, I'm going to do this. You can carve out time. Yeah, the meetings are ridiculous and budgets and all that. But I think what that does, the first couple will feel like, what did I, you know? The officer will be like, "What did I do?" Yes. You know? And uh, <laughs> like, why is why is the the captain riding with me? You know, and uh, and I think as the captain or whoever, whatever level you're at, uh, you might be feeling that too. The first few times, because mm-hmm. because especially if it's a new program and right. You might be like, well, I don't want to put them off or, you know, or you don't want to be, you don't want to be buddies with them either because there, there has to be a separation. And, uh, but I, I do see a lot of value in that where you hop in and, and then you, you make it regular. So it's not like, well, what did I do now? And, Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then that officer, you know, darn well, the next shift, they're going to be like, yeah. The major rode with me last night, and the other guys are gonna be like, "What did he say? What happened?" You know, and and so that'll kind of create some buzz. And and if they if it was a positive experience, if the uh, we had a sergeant when I was a patrol officer that was super controlling, he would do that. But then he'd be like riding shotgun, and then he'd be like, "Turn, turn, 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 turn," you know, yeah, like yeah. like. And we're yeah. just like, shut up, dude. You know, and yeah. uh, I worry, I worry about that. That there would be supervisors who are not up to speed right. on the GO, on the general orders. Yep. And and even though they should be expert in it, they are out of date. And I worry about that. And I worry about the ones who just can't not interfere because right. I see I see those second and third level supervisors come to roll calls that the sergeant is running that meeting. Yeah. But that captain walks in and just takes over the meeting. Oh yeah. It's a rare and gift. It's a rare yeah. gift when you find somebody that can relinquish the controls mm-hmm. and then just sit back and truly take on an observation. It's very rare, especially in our line of work where it's I mean, there's a reason, you know, we become cops and we want to have that control and like sit down and, uh, yeah. 
and you may have been promoted because of your ability to take charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's challenging, but yeah. there are people that when they're doing that and they're good at it, where they can just zip it and just say, "Hey, I'm just here along for the ride. Want to get to know you and what's what are you hearing? You know, I mean, is there yeah. that has to be the goal? Yep, yeah." Yeah, it's just it's just I'm I'm just building a little bit of relationship. I know who this young officer is now. I understand what their day looks like because I've had a little three hour window into it. Uh, I see what's changed since I was out here. Yeah. You know, they're they're just you're just observing. Yeah. You're not correcting. You're not evaluating. You're not leading. You're just observing. Yeah. And that, that's going to be hard. And I, I'm sure there are some supervisors who just can't do it. Right. But No, it's a great concept, though. And it's, uh, yeah, I think that's important. And it goes back to that humanizing. And we're all role models. And when we recognize that that these men and women that are out there, they're working the night shift, they're working whatever shift, they're out there. Uh, they have things going on at home, you know, whether that's relationship issues or new kids or school starting and, and, you know, they're strapped and whatever. I mean, we all have stuff. And when a, when a supervisor can pay attention to that and then like acknowledge, at least acknowledge it, they're not going to be able to help maybe, but at least acknowledge it. And certainly the major isn't going to cover the rookie patrol officers shift so they can go home and change diapers. You know, that's <laughs> no, not going to happen. No. But, it, it, you know, we just want to be heard, too, as as people. You know, we're, yep. we're yep. struggling, and it's like, man, this, this I love working nights. I love the whatever, but it's wrecking my relationship with my spouse and uh, yep. or whatever it is. And yep. uh, so just to be heard and and then just like, you know, not – one up them, you know. That's another thing some supervisors might do. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, you think you got it bad? Well, when I was your age, man, man. yeah, yeah, I had to walk uphill both ways. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to to go into it with that purpose, I think is is the key, and that's any role. If you when you're the when you are that new patrol officer, if you go into your shift with the purpose of remembering why you became a police officer, why you wanted to be a cop. Mm-hmm. And then that's what you start your shift with, with that mindset that, you know, I'm here to help people. It yeah. helps you kind of fend off that toxicity that our career can like seep in. And yes. uh, yeah. when you keep reminding yourself of your why, like, okay, why did I want to be a cop? That's huge. That's excellent. That's excellent. Tim, what else do you have going on right now? You know, uh, summertime is just, uh, it's a beautiful time for, I do a lot of music gigs. And I, when I was at my 130 level, uh, now I cap it around 40. And so I'm very selective. And then I travel around the country speaking. I, I use music and, and stories and life experiences and, and how do I call it finding your beat, the rhythm of life. And how do we, how do we navigate this life, whether it's we're working still or whether we're grandparents or high school age students how do we navigate the life taking on the challenges that come at us and not sweeping them under the rug but dealing with them but then also recognizing the beauty that's out there and that's what was really challenging for me personally in law enforcement was yeah you're out there every night and everybody you're dealing with is either going to lie to you fight you or run away from you and uh, and it's that's not reality but that's what it seems like and you get that us versus them mentality. So my mission right now is to is to call that out and say, you know, it isn't doesn't have to be us versus them. So many of my yeah. cops would come in and they'd say, well, the city is trying to do this to us. I'm like, who's the city? Yeah. yeah that doesn't even make sense. Like, are you talking about Matt, the mayor? Or, you know, like, let's break right. it down. Yeah. If it was up to me, I mean, I love talking to command staff and and having this conversation, but I want to get after the rookie patrol officer or the, more importantly, the person that's been there like five or six years Mm -hmm. that is starting to, you know, recognize this us versus them. And I think when I come in as a, as a former cop, there's some credibility there. And where if I was a, a psychologist that was in school my whole life and, and I come in and try to talk to them about mental well-being, um, you know. But normally, like a, a city or an entity would contact me and they'd say, "Hey, we're having this all-staff 
meeting, you know, and that mm-hmm. doesn't happen very often. It takes a lot of moving parts there. And then I would come in and do like an hour, hour and a half keynote and, and just like either start their day off with a oof, you know, like yeah. a, a big punch. And, uh, and it's, it's fun and we ride a roller coaster. So we're laughing at one moment and singing and telling just ridiculous stories. Yeah, you're stories. doing your music yeah. along with your speaking, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. And then, uh, so I do like three songs only. It's not a concert uh, at all, but but the, the music makes sense for the uh-huh. situation. And then, uh, so we're laughing and singing and, and we're thinking and I'm going over like what's worked for me personally. And, uh, and then we go deep into mental health and suicide. And then, so then it's not uncommon for people to be crying and then laughing again and then doing the ugly cry snort laugh thing (laughs) and uh so it's it's awesome and and i work with uh i was just in in detroit michigan speaking with child victim advocates like investigators judges um you know people that work with child victims and you you know that's a heavy job and so to to acknowledge that and then to to remind them that yeah, I and mean, we need you out there. We need you working that neighborhood yep. that nobody wants to work, and we need you doing that. But then remember that even in that neighborhood, there are there's a lot of beauty out there, and uh, yeah. So I, I love it. I mean, I, I love traveling. I love hotels and airplanes and <laughs> and uh, the the whole thing. I just love every piece of it. I was in your beautiful state not too long ago talking with, I think it was dispatchers. And oh, wonderful. It's wild, and I love every piece of it and any chance I get, you know. And then I, sometimes they, people, first question or one of the questions that's on their mind is like, how much is this going to cost? I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out, you know. And yeah. And, uh, you know, some of my clients pay my full fees, which is great. And some don't. And I'm like, yeah. whatever, if I'm available and, and would I come to Kansas city and have Jared buy me barbecue? Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll show you what a real football team looks like. Oh, come so, on now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what would be great. It would be great if it was a Vikings chiefs Super Bowl. Oh, Wouldn't I- that be great? I would just love to see the Chiefs play. I really would. Not yeah. gonna lie, I, I'm a yeah. football fan. I love the 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 whole thing about it. But it's uh, yeah, it's a pretty entertaining time for us right now. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tim, I appreciate what you do, and I appreciate you talking to me today. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, brother. Take care. Keep doing what you're doing, man. You're making a difference. Hey, thank you. I want to thank Tim because. When I called him just minutes before he was supposed to go on stage, I asked him to record an interview the very next morning, and he didn't hesitate to say yes. That's just one reason I like talking to Tim Eggerbrotten. But this topic had been eating at me for a while, and it was actually a passage from the Bible that moved me to finally make this episode. In the book of Titus, The Apostle Paul writes, Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, for us today, my hope is that you can begin to build a reputation for your department by setting this kind of good example. The views expressed here are the personal views of the host and our guests and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. This show is a free resource for everyone because of those supporters who are quietly helping behind the scenes. If you want to help this show reach cops, chaplains, and other first responders around the world, please go to the episode description and follow the link that says support this show. Thank you for listening to this bonus episode of Hey Chaplain, and as always, pray for peace in our city.